Welcome back to Bloom, a conversations podcast. I'm your host Nick Fabry and it's a delight to be joined again today by Dr. Paul Monk, an Australian writer, poet and public intellectual and longtime friend of the podcast. To recap for listeners, Bloom started producing episodes in mid-2018, making us just over five years old, which is a bit of a scary thought. In the three years before going on hiatus in late 2021 due to work and study demands, Bloom produced nearly 30 episodes with interesting and thoughtful guests on topics as diverse as arts and culture, history, politics, international relations, mental health, science, and much more. I've recently moved overseas for a master's degree, and I'm hoping to get back into a regular routine of producing these episodes, as it's something I really love doing and missed a lot over the last two years. So without further ado, welcome back to the show, Dr. Paul Monk, and to Bloom 2.0. Thanks very much, Nick. I look forward to the uh, conversation. Um, it has been a while, and for each of us, there's been a lot of water under the bridge in those two years. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, you know it's a it's a very rich world for both of us. And there's so much to talk about, and today's topic is um, one of mutual concern and mm. one of widespread public interest. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And to come to the topic and substance of the interview, which I don't think we've actually mentioned yet. Um, Today we'll be speaking about Australian security in the Indo-Pacific in the wake of the rise of China. Um, And this has been prompted by recent travels of mine from Sydney to Melbourne, where I was struck by the ubiquity of Sam Rogovine's new book called The Echidna Strategy, Australia's Search for Power and Peace, which was prominently displayed in airport bookstores, in addition to discussions about it being everywhere on Australian news and politics podcasts. For those who may not know him, Sam Rockavine is the director of the Lowy Institute's International Security Program and was founding editor of both the Lowy's highly regarded online publication, The Interpreter, and is the editor of the Lowy Papers, following a career in the Australian intelligence community. Sam's new book seeks to overturn conventional wisdom about Australian security in the Indo-Pacific in the wake of a rising and militant China and ultimately re-examines our traditional alliances with the US and other Western liberal democracies, advocating that Australia should adopt a more independent national security and defence posture. Paul Monk has written a critical review of the Echidna strategy in The Rationale and also for The Australian, and so I thought it would be great to hear from him today. Paul, can you set the scene for us and tell us a little bit about what's going on and, and what your response to Rogovine's new work has been? Yeah, the book you're referring to, of course, is The Echidna Strategy, and uh, it is written by Sam Rogovine uh, of the Lowe Institute, someone that I've known for a long time and for whom I have a high regard. Um, and he has been getting a lot of publicity, um, almost all favourable, as far as I can tell. Um, but it's clear that he's taken a stance, and he knows this, that most of the professionals of the field will disagree with. And so he's challenging people to a debate. He He sent me a copy of the book, or arranged for his publisher to do so, in the hope that I would read and review it. And when it arrived in the post, I texted him saying, "Uh, I've got a copy of your book at last. And he replied, "Uh, I look forward to being defenestrated, (laughs) which I I can just see him saying that with a smile on his face. You know, he is an open-minded man, um, and he's aware that I might well be very critical of his book. Um, And I am critical of his book, but I do think, that it's a good book, and I think that people should be reading it, uh, but reading it closely and thinking very hard about what he's saying, because this is a debate we need to have, and I believe that he has put a challenge to those of us who think we more or less know what Australia needs to do to keep thinking. And so that's what I think this conversation's about. So could you describe what Sam Rogovine sees as that geopolitical security context that Australia faces itself in and why we need a radical change in our national security uh, systems and structures? Mm. That can be encapsulated really quite simply. Um, You might almost call it the Hugh White premise because Sam is in many ways a protege of Hugh White. And for those of your listeners who are not aware of who Hugh is, he was uh, many years ago the Deputy Secretary of Defence for Strategy and Intelligence. He then became the founding director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and has since been at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University, where he's an emeritus professor now, Strategic Studies. And he has for many years now, um, I would say at least 15 years, he's been making the case that the rise of China is world-changing and that it will require of us that we change our grand strategy. 
And the core of this, as he himself has often said, and Sam picks this up and uses it as a point of departure, is that China's very rapid and, and sustained economic growth and more recently the emergence of its military capabilities as a peer competitor of the United States are game-changing. Now, where Sam goes with that, and he's very open about where that comes from uh, in terms of his data and his um, being a protege of Hugh, uh, is that not only is China becoming much more powerful, but crucially, the United States will not have the motivation and possibly not have the resources to withstand the China challenge, that it will end up withdrawing from the premier position, the dominant position it's held in East Asia since 1945, and that this completely changes our security outlook and we need to fundamentally rethink our national security in the light of that change. Mm. And so who is Sam Rogovin exactly? You've known him for a number of years. Um, who is he and how precisely does he fit in this debate, given his um, background in the intelligence service, but also at the Lowy Institute? Mm, that, that's an interesting uh, sort of personal story in a way. Uh, Sam and I first met in 1998, so that's 25 years ago now. He was then tutor in politics at Trinity College at the University of Melbourne, and I was introduced to him by a mutual friend, and Sam's question to me was, do you think I would be able to get a job in the intelligence community? I'd like to work at ONA or maybe DIO, and you've worked in DIO, you know, where as your audience may or may not know, I was head of the China desk in the last couple of years I was there. And we had this conversation and, and I said to him, we need good analysts. Uh, the, the intelligence community, to be brutally frank, is a bit of a shambles. I, I don't find it all that impressive in a lot of ways, but that's not a reason to not go into it. In some ways, it's precisely why we need good people to go into it. Um, so he did. And he worked for a number of years at o &A, then he worked at DIO, and then he got a job at the Lowy Institute, which was then, 15 years ago, relatively new. Uh, and he has been active there as the uh, editor of their online blog, The Interpreter, and now the head of their international security program. And during those years, as he says very plainly in his book, he has seen, he's watched and discussed with other professionals the rise of China. And he says uh, very plainly, I don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, I am calling for radical changes in our defence policy, but I'm not a China dove. I'm not anti-American, and I don't see myself as left wing. I see myself as a conservative in the tradition of Edmund Burke and Michael Oakeshott. Um, and uh, so that's that's the author we're talking about. And, and what I can say is I've known him through those 25 years. I've followed his career. I've stayed in touch. Um, I've read his book very closely. Um, and my first reaction to the book is this is really well written. It's very thoughtful. It's very bold, but not in a effectless way. He's, he's not making, on the whole, rash statements. He's making a clear argument from first principles and what he believes to be fundamental geopolitical realities. And then he's saying it won't do to just assume that, that a patch up of the old alliances will work because he thinks it won't. Mm. And and I would add of Sam, uh, he has to be seen by those who, unlike me, don't know him uh, as a highly intelligent, honest, uh, and very decent human being. I, you know, he's, he's the best kind of Australian. And he says in his book, I have a great respect for the profession of arms. He's not an anti-war pacifist. You know, he's, he's not a surrender monkey, you might say. Mm. So we should, it seems to me, do him uh, and ourselves the favour of uh, of reading his book with an open mind and then engage in a considered response. So that's certainly what I've attempted to do. Mm. And what exactly does Sam propose as the remedy for what he sees as Australia's unpreparedness for the increasingly complex and challenging security situation we find ourselves in, such that it's been called a, a revolutionary or an overturning of conventional wisdom? Well, uh, let me say two things um, off the bat in response to that. So the first thing, the most fundamental answer to your question is, he suggests that we completely abandon the idea of forward defence uh, and alliance with the US and its system of alliances and the US bases and uh, pull our heads in sense into our foxhole and, and make Australia singularly um, uh, difficult for China to directly attack but otherwise not provoke China in any way and operate on the assumption that China will be, for more or less the indefinite future, the dominant power in Asia. We're just going to have to live with that, he says. Mm. 
The second thing he says is that um, we shouldn't go it completely alone. We cannot depend and should not depend on the United States for all the things that it's provided for our security since the Second World War. But we should make Indonesia our new great and powerful friend. Um, and he acknowledges that that would require a lot of work. He acknowledges that we would have to rethink our policies regarding immigration, foreign policy, security policy, strategy, etc., um, and cultivate Indonesia. Why? Well, because it's it's a kind of huge archipelagic screen to our north and has um, what might at least be seen as a common interest with us in keeping China honest as it were and keeping it from being aggressive south of the east of, of the South China Sea. So you'd have to say those two are his overarching statements and then one could explore, well, exactly how would that work? But let's just step back slightly from that to hammer home that what he anticipates is that China's capabilities, which have grown very deliberately and rapidly from a very low base, um, are linked to an explicit ambition on a part of China to exclude the United States from the East Asian littoral and the Western Pacific and to be the dominant power, certainly in Asia and possibly the world. These are soaring ambitions in China. and uh, Where are they grounded in, in terms of um, direct political rhetoric? Or is this like absolutely, a yeah, policy statements? Or? Yeah, yeah, but if one takes the trouble to read into this, one can see that over decades now, the Chinese Communist Party has had this ambition. It sees China as naturally and historically the single greatest power in the world. And it sees the last 200 years of Western dominance or the last 500 years, if you like, but it's 200 years since China was, you know, uh, humbled by the Western powers in the Opium Wars. Um, it, it sees this as a blip on the screen, you know. And this is a view that many people in the West have bought into. You know, they say this is the end of the Vasco da Gama era, the era that began with, with the Western explorers coming out and finding that they had better navigation, better guns. China's resuming its natural place at the natural head of the world. Natural place in the head of the world order. Mm. That's the that's the narrative. And what Deng Xiaoping used to say in the 1990s is we need to hide our uh, ambitions and strengths and bide our time. And that was something adhered to by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, his uh, successors. Um, Xi Jinping is not hiding and he's not biding. He's come right out and he said, we're going to be it. And anybody who gets in our way, well, suffer the consequences. Mm. It's very bold rhetoric and it's very militaristic rhetoric. Um, and it's distinctly anti-American. Mm. Um, and at the same time, and this is something that, that Sam, of course, dwells upon and many of us have been aware of, the United States has stumbled a few times in the 21st century from its unipolar moment. It, it appears, many would say, to have fumbled the ball, not only in terms of international security policy with the difficulties it ran into when it invaded Iraq with its decision finally to give up in Afghanistan, um, but domestically, um, with deepening political divisions, a kind of legislative deadlock, and of course the phenomenon of Donald Trump, which is immensely controversial, uh, and beyond the personality of Donald Trump, um, the challenges to the constitutional order uh, and a growing sense of isolationism, that the US is overcommitted, that its allies are free riders, that, um, that it should pull back and look after itself, heal its domestic wounds, etc. Uh, pretty much as it did after the First World War. Um, all of that, Sam says, we need to understand very clearly and think very coolly about where that leaves us because it does leave us in a precarious position. Indeed. And to sort of step back at a meta level, why has Australia um, in particular, but also other uh, Western allies that under the sort of the Kansas arrangements or the, um, the US as well, but why have the liberal Western democracies been kind of so slow to wake up to this real threat of, of, of China, which seems to me to be the main game in terms of geopolitics and the, um, I suppose, the, the broader realignment of those tectonic plates, if you want to think about it in that way. We've kind of been distracted by, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, regional frontier historic conflicts, really. Mm. And I suppose, so why have we been so slow to wake up? And I guess, what is the broad landscape of debate? You've got Sam Rogovines, but other, has there been other thinking going on in Australia in the oh, West there, more broadly? There absolutely has. I mean, the AUKUS agreement is evidence that mainstream opinion is is 
very different to Sam's, right? And he's conscious of that, and he directly challenges that opinion quite fearlessly, and and that seems to me quite lucidly. But let's go back to the fundamental question you're asking there, the the question about the liberal democracies and the rise of China. So um, the simplest way to put this is that two things have been happening simultaneously. One is that since the end of the Cold War, the Western democracies led by the United States um, developed the opinion uh, that, you know, in the words of Frank Fukuyama uh, back in the early 90s, history in the sense of conflicts between ideologies and contentions about how human society should be run was essentially over. Liberal democracy and capitalism had won and they would prevail. It was just a matter of time before everybody bought into that. In China, uh, something very different was taking place. Uh, and Rush Doshi, in his path-breaking book on China's grand strategy, The Long Game, um, makes the point that at the end of the Long War, 1989 through 91, there was a trifecta of um, what, from the Communist Party's point of view, were uh, deeply disturbing, if not catastrophic events. The first was the democracy movement in China, which threatened the Communist Party's hold on power and directly called for its removal from power and the democratisation of China. They crushed that in Tiananmen Square. Um, and their point of view was that never again, we're not going down that path. Um, the Western democracies, on the other hand, looked at that with dismay but thought that's a road bump. They will democratise because they don't really have an option. It, to the extent that they prosper, which they manifestly want to do and have started to do, a middle class will develop and it will demand a greater... Uh, accountability of its government, greater political representation, more civic rights. The same had happened as other countries developed, that South Korea, Taiwan, Japan and East Asia, you know. And so the assumption set in the West that that's the path China was on. And therefore, let's cultivate that. Let's allow China to reach itself. Let's admit it to the World Trade Organization. Let's invest in China. And as Bill Clinton said in the 1990s, democratization will follow as night follows day, right? Hmm. But from the Communist Party's point of view, not only had it suffered that setback, the next setback was the collapse of the Soviet bloc, you know, which caught them by surprise, as indeed it did many people in the West. But whereas in the West we thought, this is wonderful, this is history heading in the right direction, the Communist Party of China took it exactly the other way. This is a disaster. How can this have happened? Gorbachev was a fool. He was a traitor to the cause, right? And that was deeply ingrained in the Communist Party. And, and we didn't, as it were, in the West, take sufficient notice of that. The third thing that occurred, and this is crucial to the military scenario, is that Chinese military observers watched closely what the US did in the Gulf War, where Saddam Hussein said, you're facing the mother of all battles, you're going to get me out of Kuwait. And he had a veteran large army with Soviet equipment that had just beaten Iran to its corner in an eight-year war. Uh, and the expectation that Saddam plainly had, that the Chinese Communist Party had, is the US is getting in for a real fight here. The US swept Saddam's army off the table like children's toys in a couple of days. It was awe-inspiring. And the Chinese were deeply alarmed by this because they said, we've got the same military equipment Saddam had, but we haven't even fought a war in anger in many years. We would get swept off the table the same way. That's That's terrifying. So they said, we have to modernise our military. And they set about doing it, and they've continued doing it, right? Mm. And they began by developing the capacity uh, to deny the US, to the best of their ability, access to their littoral seas, right? And a capacity to just sail up and down Taiwan straight into terror any move to retake Taiwan. As that succeeded and their economy continued to grow, they got more ambitious, and they're invested in every aspect now of high technology, 21st century military capability, to the point where they're very close now to being a direct peer competitor of the United States in military as well as economic terms. That's what's changed. And it's not gone the way we expected. And our thinking about it from a policy um, and alliance, a diplomatic sense, has been um, slow to sort of wake up to that. But obviously, necessarily, the, the lag, I suppose, in force posture and force structure and also procurement um, increasing acquisition of defence capabilities, capacities as well, not just here in Australia, but as a web of alliances of liberal democracies who support the status quo of the of the US as being the security guarantor of the region as it has been since World War Two. Mm. So to come back to the status quo, the fact that we're sort of slow on, on the march here to sort of rise to meet the threat, it seems to me we're um, heading into a bit of an acute danger zone where... You know, China might look, look to get a march on us, basically, if it were to, to to seek to aggressively retake Taiwan, for instance. 
But coming back to Sam and what he proposes in a sort of a concrete substantive sense, you mentioned obviously the total kind of reconceptualization, re stumping, rewiring, replumbing, for want of a better term, of the ADFs. Uh, capabilities and capacities and sort of assuming more of an, an echidna defensive position, basically securing the homeland, as I think Paul Keating and a lot of people in the Labor caucus, Labor luminaries put it, but also secondarily in terms of forging that direct alliance with Indonesia, which is also a, a Keating prescription in terms of security guarantee. I think you fo- the formulation was their people, our guns or something. Um, but to come back into a concrete sense and what Sam proposes, what would it actually look like to radically... Um, redesign the status quo of Australia's defence position? So the first thing, as I remarked, that he says very pointedly is um, the US is unlikely to fight, and if it did, is unlikely to win a war with China, and if we were its ally, we would get drawn into that war, and we would be on the losing side, and we cannot afford that. That would be a disaster. So he argues, right? Therefore, we should not get the, the... Submarines, the nuclear submarines, they are the apex predator. That you know, if our intention was to have uh, forward defence, to be part of the US alliance, to have uh, striking power, well, we would certainly get those, and that's why we are getting them. But we shouldn't. And he says the thing about those submarines is they would enable, they're intended to enable us to strike targets in China. But consider, if we strike targets in China, China is far better placed than we are to escalate and hit us back, right, with long-range missiles, etc. And we could suffer severe damage of a kind we've never suffered before. Um, so we shouldn't go there. We should not get these submarines. We don't need long-range submarines. What we need is close-in defence, and that means more missiles, more sea mines. We need cyber capabilities. We need uh, air and sea denial capabilities. But he says, and here's the good news, if that's all we're trying to do, we don't need to spend a fortune on defence. If we reallocate our expenditure and prioritise what we need to deter the Chinese from actually attacking Australia, which he believes we could do, then we don't need to spend great sums of money. Um, And the key to his argument, which sounds counterintuitive, is that he says distance is our greatest ally. You know, Geoffrey Blaney made famous the term the tyranny of distance decades Mm. ago. He says the reality is that, that Sydney is further from Beijing than London is. We're a long way from China. And... In the worst case, it can't send more than, you know, a finger of its hand in our direction. We can deal with that. And if we're clear enough that all we're seeking to do is to deter invasion, to deter direct attack, Beijing can get that message. Whereas if we're part of an alliance that's seeking to box China in, constrain its actions, prevent it from retaking Taiwan, etc., mm. well, then we're provoking China, right? And the cost could be very high. So uh, that's, that's the net picture, right? And... Um, and that would look like perhaps getting um, removing Pine Gap and a lot of the US defensive structures and technological Absolutely. arrangements on Australian soil because we do kind of already fit into that web of alliances, but also I guess the arc, the security architecture of um, you look at um, the Quad, for instance. You know, mm-hmm. I guess you know strategic lines of, of defence from the south, you know, to the east with Japan, to the west with India, and so on. So we are already in a way, built into that, and we rotate, you know, US defence um, personnel, or security personnel mm. through Australia. We have deep into linkages. Um, for Australia to withdraw into that, into its little uh, spiky ball and down its burrow, perhaps, mm. um, would have serious ramifications, implications for um, US security more globally. It's not just like... Uh, absolutely, it would. If we did what Sam recommended, and he's conscious of this, he's not oblivious to it, it would... It would totally uproot our role in the US alliance. Um, And the US bases are crucial not simply to the defence of Australia, but to the US global system of order, stability and deterrence. Mm -hmm. He's saying we've got to abandon that because it's not going to work anymore. And and this is where his prescription gets more and more alarming because he's really saying that US system is going to crumble anyway uh, and it's delusional to believe that it can be sustained. Um, and, And, you know... Probably, I would say, the first and most fundamental point of entry for my response to his prescriptions is, if that was so, if the US really um, was looking unsustainable in, in the eastern, in East Asia and Western Pacific, then one would expect that the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Taiwanese, the Filipinos, the Vietnamese would all be talking very differently. They'd all be saying what Sam's saying, this, this is not going to last, we have to 
cut to the chase and change our security policy or count out of China or go nuclear or whatever. All of them are saying to the United States, don't go away. Mm. Don't go away. Let's talk very seriously about how we constrain China to behave decently and moderately because otherwise this is going to be a real mess. It also rebukes that um, notion that Paul Keating and others um, have put forward that, you know, AUKUS and the sort of the strengthening of the Australia, US, UK, New Zealand sometimes uh, alliance system or cooperation systems, um, interoperability um, is a reversion to the sort of Anglo, you know, white European, you know, structures or histories that we've shared. Mm. It's actually a cosmopolitan, you know, it, it absolutely Asian, is. Pacific, it, you know. Yeah, if I jump in, I've made this point in challenging Keating directly in print, right? The idea that that what we're doing is, in his phrasing, seeking security from Asia rather than security in Asia, is our nonsense. Um, we're not seeking security from Asia. We're seeking security in Asia, and we're doing it with the other allies of the United States who are Asian. Mm. Right? It's, uh, you know, he went so far recently as to describe Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, and India, uh, which is quad plus, as a bunch of U.S. deputy sheriffs, and I commented in print, well, some bunch of deputy sheriffs. Mm. You're talking about a, a group of the richest uh, democratic states in Asia. If, if they're getting together and wanting to be partners of the U.S. to keep China honest, is security from Asia, what's Asia? Mm. What's Asia? Mm. China? I mean, this is nonsense. Right, so this is a fundamental difference of opinion that I hold with, certainly with Keating, and I believe with Sam. I think that it's an error, and I think that if we run scared of China because of its ambitions and its sudden increase in power, we are going to aggravate the situation, not improve it. We need to hold our nerve. We need to be very clear-headed. We need, if possible, to avoid World War Three. We don't want World War Three. Precisely, what we want to do is deter China from going down a path that could lead to world war. And it's interesting to come back to Sam and the, the echidna strategy because he couches his text in his own personal philosophical political position as a conservative. But it mm. seems to me that ultimately what he proposes is quite a radical policy diplomatic prescription of a kind that has never really occurred in, in Australia at all, really, because we've always sort of relied, you know, given our isolation and our comparative kind of smallness in terms of, you know, mass of population, lethality on, for want of a better term, big and powerful friends and a strong alliances of like-minded, um, you know, democracies and other political structures. And mm. to radically kind of do away with that would, would well, <laughs> this is radical, right? Absolutely. It, it's extraordinarily so, and to an extent that I think he hasn't really thought through. Let's take an analogy. Let's suppose that he was writing not in... 2023, but in 1933, for, for argument's sake, right? Mm. And he was saying, Japan is on the rise. Japan is just an ex-Manchuria. Japan will be the dominant power in Asia, and we have to accustom ourselves to that. The US is far away. It's isolationist. It's not going to intervene, and we don't want to provoke Japan. So Japan will dominate Asia. We have to live with that. Let's try and... Um, you know, get along with uh, maybe the Dutch in the East Indies, you know, and hope that between us we can at least keep Japan honest. Meanwhile, let's keep trading with Japan and, and so on. Um, we, uh, If we were in 1933, how would we respond to that? That's an interesting question. But once you draw the analogy near you know, how that ended, you would surely say, well, that didn't work, mm. right? Uh, if Japan had over on Asia and the US had not intervened, if there'd been no Pearl Harbor because the US had said, we're not getting into this, would Australia have been secure? Would we have been able to have an echidna strategy then by 1940-41 that would have deterred Japan from attacking Australia? I don't think so. Yeah. Right? But but let me add one more thing, and this is crucial. The, the world order that the US has held together economically, militarily, diplomatically in terms of nuclear deterrence since 1945 has generated the greatest era of prosperity, peace and democratisation in human history, bar none. And China has been a beneficiary of that. China would not have had this explosive growth had it not been given entree to an already rich, highly developed, open trading system, which the US created and presided over and welcomed China into, in the belief that that would give us China a stake in the system. Now Xi Jinping is saying, yeah, bugger that, we're going to make it our own, mm. right? That's a problem. And Sam's response is to say, 
we have to accept that China will govern the new order. And in that order, he explicitly says, there will be no room for liberal principles or human rights. That's the single most alarming statement in his book. What has modernization been all about? What has development been all about if we don't and we abandon liberal principles and human rights? Would you wish to exist in, a, in an Asian Indo-Pacific region in which we didn't want to fight for those things and seek to preserve them and uphold them and, and expand them where other countries wish to yeah. do so? I mean, you, you know, liberal principles and human rights are, are what made South Korea vastly more attractive than North Korea. They've made what Japan become a friendly, attractive place instead of a fascist state. It's what made Taiwan an open democracy and a thriving, peaceful place and a tourist destination instead of a dictatorship under Chiang Kai-shek. And he's saying there'll be no place for these. Indonesia has made some progress in those directions since the end of Saharo's regime, and in distinction also from the earlier Sukarno. Is he saying, forget about all that? That's a horrendous vision. That's dystopian. But this is the, the paradox, it seems to me, of the, of the modern debate around Australia's role in the world, the whole security, geopolitical situation we find ourselves in, Really, it's China that whose resurgence and acquisition of new defence capabilities, um, increasing kind of aggressiveness towards its neighbours in the South China Sea and beyond, its broader designs on sort of seeking regional he hegemony. That's they're the radical ones. They're the ones upsetting the apple carts. And too often the debate is cast in Australia being provocative or the Western de uh, democracies, including you know the Asian democracies as well, South Korea, Japan, because we're seeking to um, acquire new capabilities like, you know, submarines or whatever it might be, or missiles or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones and things. But that's actually, we're prudently, cautiously trying to meet um, the threat of a, of a nation which is, frankly, radically seeking to overturn the peace, security, stability, relatively, of the last 80 years. Absolutely, and which, in the way it operates internally and the way its rhetoric uh, comes across, if you're paying close attention to it, and Xi Jinping's personal rhetoric, mm -hmm. deeply alarming. I mean, we need to remind ourselves that at every point in the last 100 years where the best educated people in China have been able to express themselves openly, they've called for modernization and democracy in China. And by democracy, they meant liberal principles and human rights. They didn't mean Leninism, which is what the party has imposed on China. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, there's ample evidence that if it wasn't for the Communist Party being so repressive and so systematic in controlling thought, uh, China probably would democratise. The assumption in the West that it would democratise was hinged to the idea, well, it's happened elsewhere. Other dictatorships, Franco's in Spain, Park Chung-hee's in South Korea, Chiang Kai-shek's in Taiwan, you know, they've given way to democracy peacefully. Why would China not do it? And the answer is the Chinese Communist Party. That's the roadblock. It's not Western imperialism. Right? It's not mm. anything about traditional Chinese culture. It's the Chinese Communist Party. And if we're not prepared to face it down, it'll keep going. Mm. And Sam you know, talks about making um, a change or basically flicking a switch to, you know, we can radically or substantially change the way we do things in terms of defence, diplomacy, politics in Australia, you know, as if it was sort of like flicking a light bulb. And, and he points to the example of Olaf... Schultz in, in Germany after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, you know, quickly moving towards, um, you know, basically increasing G Germany's defence capabilities. And, you know, is, is that actually possible to do in such a short amount of time? And, and, and what is the actual, given the significant revolution, basically, that I think Rogovin is ultimately calling for, is Australia fit to make such a radical shift? The shortest possible answer is No. But let's start with Olaf Scholz, right? So um, he does, as you say, um, state uh, very explicitly that uh, rapid changes can be made, as witnessed what Olaf Scholz did in Germany. But he omits to mention several things. The first is that uh, Olaf Scholz um, put Germany on the front foot at a time when, as a leading um, member of NATO, uh, he was party to a discussion within NATO that was putting the whole of NATO on the front foot, right? He wasn't acting on his own. Secondly, he was on the front foot, where Sam's saying we should get very much on the back foot. Thirdly, uh, Schultz knew in saying that that Germany is a highly industrialised state and it has the whole of the EU behind it. Australia is a largely de-industrialised state, which doesn't have, particularly if it abandons the US alliance, it doesn't have anything around it to buttress it, right? Mm. 
he also doesn't mention that Sweden and Finland, given Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which had been neutral, you know, for the longest time, in Sweden's case, centuries, in Finland's case, since the Second World War, suddenly they're saying, we want to be part of NATO. Why? Well, look what Putin's doing. You know, we don't think we could withstand that on our own. We want to be able to deter him. NATO's a much better deterrent, right? Sam doesn't even mention this, you know, and, and yet um, what he's recommending is that we embrace neutralism at a point when when Sweden and Finland, the most principled, prosperous, neutral states in the EU, are hammering on the door of NATO and being admitted, mm. right? So this is deeply counterintuitive, right? And one has to say two other things. The first is, if we went down that path, if we suddenly did an Olaf Scholz in reverse, right, and said we're going neutral, I think, rather than the rest of Asian countries saying, oh, Australia's finally seeing good sense and what's security in Asia, we would be a laughingstock. Mm. They would say, Australia, what are they smoking? Yep. They have lost the plot. And, and finally, in order to make that change, even if it was to be welcomed by others, we would have to make the most fundamental structural and cultural changes in our you know, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, our Department of Defence, our armed forces, our intelligence agencies, because everything that's made them function and been orientation forever is suddenly out the window. Mm. That's just not practicable. And before we go into the actual capabilities of the Australian economy and, and society and political um, structures to be able to actually uh, render such a, a substantive, massive change, as Rogovin argues, in terms of its industrial base, its energy, you know, fuel security, etc. Um, I'd love to come back to this idea of what do we actually mean by like a forward, um, what do we mean by on the front foot or on the back foot or a forward sort of defence structure or just this sort of defensive back foot? Like what, what does that actually look like and what does it mean? Yeah, and, and they said I think this is where you, you want to go with that, that we'll define those terms and then consider that perhaps the benefit of reading and critiquing Sam's radical prescriptions is that there is something to be said mm. for buttressing our spiny capabilities. Indeed, right? yeah. like a middle way. But not, yeah. not by way of abandoning which is his main premise, abandoning the US alliance and deterrence. But to go back to um, to your primary question, so when we talk about getting on the front foot or getting on the back foot, I, clearly what Schultz did is he said, oh, we will um, actively now, without directly declaring war on Russia, we will actively oppose its active aggression, and which we denounce in the strongest terms as unacceptable, we will arm the Ukrainians. We will stand with NATO in imposing sanctions on Russia. You know, uh, we will increase our defence spending in order to demonstrate that it, you know if Russia is going to behave like this, it will face armed opposition ultimately. Um, that's getting on the front foot, right? Mm. And it has to be said that he declared those things within four days of the invasion of Ukraine. He's been slower. His government's been slower to enact those things, but it's moving in that direction. Yeah. By getting on the back foot, Sam is essentially saying, if we'd been Germany and we were doing what he's recommending, we would have said, you know, we're not getting involved here. We're not arming Ukraine. We're not yep. increasing our defence spending. We're, we're even withdrawing from NATO. Uh, you know, um, we, we won't countenance or support the admission of new members to NATO. Right. We, we, will, we will defer to Russia. It's the dominant power in Eastern Europe and it's likely to remain so. That's what Olaf Scholz would have done if he was taking yep. Sam's approach. But I suppose the broader uh, import or meaning of what Sam was saying is that whether it's going on the front foot or on the back foot or forward-leaning defence or, you know, um, more defence of the homeland, the, the fact that those big policy shifts can occur, occur rapidly is possible in Germany. It's why the, exa- the parallel doesn't work really in my mind because Germany is a, you know, um, heavily populated country supported by the eu nato it's deeply industrialized one of the most advanced and sophisticated economies in the world i actually don't think that parallel exists in australia in terms of our you know it absolutely doesn't it absolutely doesn't and if you take just one index of that right if we broke with the us alliance to go alone we would be um in terms of our intelligence system for example you know we would be um crippling ourselves because we are deeply embedded in five eyes. We depend on the United States and its global intelligence system and to a lesser extent the British intelligence system and have since the Second World War and in our conferences and exchanges with our English-speaking allies to actually understand what's going on in the world. If we abandon all of that, we've got a 
you know, do all of that for ourselves. Now, Sam might respond, but we don't need to do all of that. We're not part of the Earth's alliance. All we need to do are the intelligence capabilities to monitor what's happening in our immediate region. Well, maybe, but do we want to do that? Do we want to basically withdraw into a cave and say, we don't know what's going on, we don't care? Mm. I wouldn't have thought so, all right? Yeah. If, as he says, we should get on the front foot in this respect, uh, diplomatically, that is that we should work very hard diplomatically to encourage the great powers to form some kind of concert so they can sort out their interests without going to war, then we would need uh, even better intelligence and certainly better diplomatic service than we have now. He doesn't even begin to describe how that would take place. Mm. So having done a general survey of the Echidna strategy and, and Sam's overall thesis, could you outline the merits behind what he's actually saying with regards to the fact that we've just had a defense strategic review which is and we have this at every decade or so you know the, the defense white paper i think in 2009 we often do think about how our defense is structured and whether we can do things differently and i must say when i heard about the overall thesis of the echidna strategy some of it struck me as being seductive and compelling like the idea of the fact we need um you know uh, sea mines, uh, greater investment in drones and missiles, so this denial capability of our homeland, which uh, as a defence service personnel or person myself, I see is like sorely lacking. So what, what would you say is the merit to what Sam's saying? I think there's certainly merit. We've always had as a fundamental axiom about defence policy that if, if it comes right down to it, we must be able to defend the continent of Australia. That's what a defence force is primarily for. And if what Sam is saying is we currently are so committed to forward defence and possible operations in US wars that we haven't thought through how would we have defend Australia, that's worth visiting, right? And and because of the way military technology has gone ahead by leaps and bounds in the 21st century, there's a very good case to be made that we should rethink and rebalance what we're doing in that regard. And that's a complex debate in itself. My biggest misgiving about the strategic review and white papers over the years is that uh, they appear to me to basically be papers written for a government where the tacit understanding is this is what we're prepared to spend on defence. Um, tell us what you can get within that budget. Mm -hmm. and so it's such a political document rather than a rigorously strategic one. Whereas the question should be, what is it we really need to do um, not in terms of wish lists, but in terms of, of sober scenario planning and capability, then we need to spend that amount, mm. right? And it could be not 1% or 2% of GDP, which our governments have tended to be, you know, content to spend. It might be 5 or 6% of GDP. South Korea used to spend 6% of its GDP, right? Um, so the question is, uh, given all of that background, what could we be doing? Well, we clearly could be developing area denial capabilities along the general lines that Sam has suggested without prejudice to our alliance with the United States because he could be saying that's a scenario that could occur. Suppose he's correct and, and a war took place in Taiwan, which we lost, and we would need to fall back on being able to deter attack on Australia. We'd want to have that in place. We wouldn't want to start trying to prepare at that point, right? And nobody within our alliance system could reasonably say, well, we shouldn't have those capabilities. And he himself says they wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. So I think there's everything to be said for saying, let's do that. Let's have asymmetric capabilities that could be relied upon to deter a direct assault on Australia and its maritime territories by an aggressive China, mm. right? That's well worth thinking through. But that's quite independent of his major premise, uh, and it's not his fundamental prescription, which is the radical idea that we just pull in and look after number one and forget everything else, human rights, liberal principles, US alliance, US bases, Taiwan, democracy, whatever, mm. forget it. Mm. Just hunker down and defend ourselves and, and believe or cross our fingers and hope that China won't get serious about attacking Australia because then we could deter it yeah. if it's not really serious. If it's really serious and we have no allies and no fundamental abilities other than a bit of area denial, we, we're cooked. But you can't even assume such a defensive... Um Struct, uh, posture without foregoing all the all the things that I think make Australia worthwhile, which is a free and open economy, you know, trade, interpersonal connections and exchanges, a diplomatic, cultural sharedness. I don't think we could maintain all those good things if we kind of don't pull our weight, basically, in terms of looking after the peace and order of the region. Uh, I'm being to... part of a global system yeah. of liberal principles and free trade, exactly so, and, and of democracies. And it seems to me if we did, in fact embrace Sam's prescription. And I don't accuse him 
of foreseeing and and accepting this. I think it's a blind spot on his part. I think if we went down that path, we would suffer an attack of cultural despair. Mm. We, mm. we would implode politically and socially. Um, and uh, that's not to be welcomed. The, the benign way, which I suspect is what he imagines, is if we were adopting a kind of Finland stance, all right, mm. then Finland was neutral through the Cold War. And it did have armed forces in the belief that it would defend itself if it really had to, and that it, what it had would at least deter the U, uh, Soviet Union from having another crack at it, as it did in 1939 in the Winter War. But what that overlooks is that Finland was only able to do that because NATO was there keeping the Soviet Union at bay, mm. right? Whereas what he's saying is the US is not going to be there, and in any case, we shouldn't encourage it to be there. Well, that's a wholly different world. Yeah, it's a disturbing thought. But I think, I mean, to link this to the debate with um, a lot of the arguments of the late Jim Mullen, Senator Jim Mullen, um, and also I think even Treasurer Josh Frydenberg in terms of, I think, a lot of the, the rhetoric that came out about national resilience across, um, you know, basically securing the independence of our manufacturing base, food security, fuel security, um, you know, advanced manufacturing to be able to make missiles, drones, other things like that. I think there's a big gap until the Australian economy is actually able, and society is able to actually support um, a either a mid-range, you know, change in our defence, as you've described, which is sort of importing a lot of the self-sufficient defence capabilities, but not sort of throwing away the US um, alliances and systems and nuclear subs and AUKUS, basically. Um, there's a huge way to go there for us to actually meet that enhanced sovereign capability, I think is the expression, um, but also, I think a huge gap in the public's expectation about what might be required in terms of um, allocation of public resources, and maybe you are going to be spending four to six percent of GDP on defence. I, I just think we're so far away from any of those two kind of conditions being met yeah. to actually one meet what Rogovine's putting forward, and two maybe even meeting the I think sensible midpoint between the two positions mm. that you are advocating, where I'm advocating here today. Yeah. So it's, you know, uh, Jim Mullen, as you say, before he died, did argue this in Danger on a Dual Step. Ross Babbage, who is another veteran of the defence and intelligence system, has written, uh, written or published a book recently called uh, The Next Major War, in which he makes a similar case. And, and that case, you know, pivots on the observation that Australia is so accustomed to security and so completely engaged in the international liberal order that the US has created and defended that we have run down all our capacities for any serious national security resilience. And that's alarming in what appears to be an increasingly dangerous world. All right? um, and it seems to me that, that what Sam is saying, well, provided we got a bit of extra kit at the margin, um, we'll be fine. Well, I don't think so. Um, mm. And I think that there's a very good point to be made that because of the liberal international order and because of the strong complementarities between our resource bases and China's development, we have allowed our manufacturing to wither away and we've profited net handsomely from China's growth. But that depends on China remaining open and part of an integrated order. If that starts to come apart, as it has started to come apart, we're very vulnerable, right? And I think people, we're more vulnerable than people think we are because mm. it seems to me that that sort of danger zone for a, catastroph a catastrophic war is going to come sooner than people think and certainly sooner than the um, all of our new defence um, equipment coming on stream like the Tomahawk missiles or the nuclear sub, which are decades away um, because China is facing, you know, some serious long-term structural issues, whether they be economic or demographic, which might force it and obviously the fact that the Western liberal um, defence capabilities will improve over the next 10 to 20 years. But it's almost like the time is ripe for them to do something if they were to, you know, seek to t take Taiwan or radically re reorder the South China Sea. And so the danger is on our, do on our doorstep, as Molan said. It, it is. And, and um, it's worth uh, emphasising this. There's a book which you're clearly aware of by Hal Brands and Michael Beckley, published in the past 12 months, called uh, Danger Zone. Um and their argument is that um, the Chinese Communist Party is well aware that it faces the looming challenges to which you referred, um, that beyond 2030, it's going to face a rapidly ageing population, uh, a decline in its productivity, very serious problems with environmental deterioration, um, 
and it doesn't have a welfare system to cope with the rapidly aging population and shrinking workforce. Uh, and it's refused to undertake the economic reforms that would liberalise the system and ease some of that pressure. And therefore, it is going to face growing challenges of, uh, you know, a fiscal kind. How does it allocate resources? Does it allow old people to just die on the vine without care? Do, does it um, does it ignore its environmental problems, serious as they are, massive pollution and so on? Or does it reallocate resources? If it reallocates resources, it will not have the same amount of resources to spend on the military and on internal security. And and if it doesn't cope well with the internal challenges, then it may need to double down on internal security or face political crisis, mm. and perhaps regime implosion. This has happened to China before. Mm. And why? Because of its fundamental and long-lasting governance model. The Communist Party is an exaggerated version of old Chinese autocracy. And while people talk about how China was supposedly really well governed historically, it wasn't. Dynasties kept failing and imploding, right? Because past a certain point, corruption, brittleness, ignorance of what's really going on, frustration on a part of people, they can't get redress, they can't change the government, etc. It leads to a system to implode. We could well see that, they argue, beyond 2030. And the Communist Party uh, therefore may decide that it, this is peak China now. If they want Taiwan back, they better take it while they're going good. So our best bet is to be really clear about all of this and seek to make clear to China that the costs of going to war, win, lose or draw, would be very high and ongoing. Don't go there. Work this out intelligently. That can be done, right? We need to do that. And and Mullen and, and Babbage, of course, like others, and, and Brands and Beckley emphasised the military deterrence and possibly war fighting aspects of this. I think that the economic and diplomatic are just as important. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I think I think that's true, and I think as well. Uh, one thing that worries me is the actual, um, perhaps the fragility of I, I believe the political consensus in Australian political media, civil society to actually see through what we need to see through in order to safeguard the nation because we had recent commentary in the media from Bob Carr um, saying that, you know, if the worst thing that happened to Taiwan was the imposition of the kind of civil um, restrictions and so on that's been experienced in Hong Kong since China sort of seized the legislature there and, you know, took it back, took it back essentially 20-odd years earlier than it was meant to, then Bob Carr could, could live with that new model um, on our doorstep in the South China Sea and in, in the Asian community, which are apart. And then obviously you had Paul Keating saying that, you know, the whole Taiwan question, like Xinjiang, like Hong Kong, like Tibet, was really a civil matter for for uh, for China and it was not... Well, and he referred to Taiwan as, and I quote, a so-called democracy. Yeah. So-called. Yeah, and so these views do have roots, right, in the Australian polity, in the media. A lot of Rogovin's um, work has, I think, been reported on and sort of, you know, lapped up, I would say, quite uncritically. I mean, you're really the first person that I know of to have sort of substantially critiqued and and uh, and engaged with the work. Um, so do you think there are... And obviously, the, I mean, that's in the Australian, right, domestic setting, but then we've obviously got the... The spectre of Donald Trump haunting the haunting the Republican Party and the and the and the and the White House too. If he comes, what happens to the alliance system? So it's not clear to me that there's one like a, a firm resolve here in Australia domestically. And two, it's not clear that even internationally, in terms of our relations with the state, that we'll be able to see through the web of alliances. Yeah, sure. And 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 you know the best part of what Sam is um, offering us is precisely that concern. All right. Um, And so it's not, as you indicated earlier, it's not all or nothing. We can read Sam conservatively, let's say, and say, well, we can adjust at the margin. We can do good scenario planning. We can prepare to, you know, have a fallback position if things really do deteriorate in the way that he suggests. But we we shouldn't even contemplate doing this preemptively and quickly because that would be a, a mess, frankly. Right. But to go back to your observation about Bob Carr, the, it's disturbing enough, and I said this in print in response to that remark of his, that a man who takes his own civil and political liberties entirely for granted would say, but he can live with it if, if another country with the same population and the same civil liberties loses them, mm-hmm. right, as Hong Kong has lost its. Um, but it gets worse because Sam has implied, Hugh White has even said at times, and, and Bob Carr appears to be of the same school of thought, 
that we ourselves would have to restrict the way in which we speak about China, criticise human rights abuses, etc., uh, in order to live in such a world. In other words, we would have to more or less impose on ourselves the kinds of restrictions that China is imposing in Hong Kong and says it will impose on Taiwan. And, and to quote Sam's phrase, in the world in which we would be an echidna, there would be no room for liberal principles or human rights. And we would, at times, he says in another phrase, have to be more ruthless, more ruthless in our approach to what? To our neighbours? To our own censorship regime? He doesn't really spell that out, but it seems to me that's a, that's a really unpleasant future to look at, and, yeah. and I would resist going there any way I could. But there are reasons to think very hard about our national security, our integrated national security policy, and our resilience. And just to bring the interview to an end, um, also, you know, I'm concerned there's one thing to, to, it's good that we're thinking seriously about it and that the def- defence strategic review has happened, that I think AUKUS is underway, the status quo seems to be maintained despite a little, you know, a bit of rattling at the, you know, political branches and at the within the caucuses and things. But it's not really clear to me that anything substantially has changed, whether they're actually spending the money, they're actually sort of rolling out these programs. Um, you know, are we are we sort of going to actually deliver what we've promised on the path that we're currently on, regardless of what Sam and, and you and others might come up with as alternative or middle ways? It's like, it's sort of like even the path we're on today, it doesn't seem to be like it's got traction. So. Mm. I think it's true, and I think it's partly because whereas the Labor Party, when they came into office a year or so ago, made clear from day one that they were not going to break with the uh, AUKUS agreement and with the national security settings that the coalition had put in place. Nevertheless, as a party uh, and as a matter of long-standing social policy, their preference is to spend more on social welfare, health and education than on defence. And that's in fact what they're doing, right? So they're, they're, they're talking the talk, but it's not clear they're walking the walk, mm. right? Um, and that's why we can see, or it's one of the reasons why we can see Beijing being more accommodating towards the Albanese government than they were towards the, you know, the uh, the Morrison, uh, Morrison government. Mm. Um, Albanese is now set to visit Beijing. What will he say? Well, it seems clear that he will not even raise the question of of Yang Hengjun and Chi Lang, who are Chinese Australian citizens in in PRC jails, uh, who have never got anything that we would call procedural justice. Right, who, who don't have the normal uh, civil and legal rights granted them that any such person would be given in a Western democracy. Um, to not even raise that question, that's appeasement of the Communist Party, mm. pure and simple. All right, And it's not a good look if, if what we're saying is we're standing up to China. It, it's compromising right up front on those very things we said that Sam would jettison, that is liberal principles and human rights. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Paul. We are beaten by the buzzer, unfortunately. Have a a lunch to get to, which will be delightful, but I'm sure we'll continue the conversation another time. Absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground. It's been terrific.